and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us straight from Dice Tale Games, the developers of Blood and Doom, which managed to raise raise about 151,000 euros on its particular Kickstarter. The one and only Ferruccio, Ferruccio Argento. Jeez, I talk about pronunciation and then I screw it up already. How are you doing today? <laughs> it's fine, it's fine. Hi, and uh, thank you for having me. Uh, great to be here. So yeah, it's Ferruccio Argento. And so for anyone listening, then they already uh, know how to pronounce my uh, uh, ridiculously complicated Italian name. So uh, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yep. Thank you for coming on. So I'll, I'll start at the humble beginnings, as I often do in these. Walk me through your first introduction to mm. role-playing games and what made it stick. My first introduction. Uh, okay, well, my very first introduction was an attempt, and I'll say an attempt, at playing D&D 3.5. Uh, I think when it was like very recently released uh, back in the day uh, but this being uh, prior to the internet days and me just trying this game out with some friends uh, not getting acquainted with it by any means of like playing with other people who already knew the game or knew how it worked or whatever I had a lot of trouble uh, getting into it so I gave it a few attempts uh, but it, it never really stuck. Um, but always been a, a big fan, uh, at least, for example, in the form of playing games like Baldur's Gate, which I was a huge fan of when I was uh, younger. Um, and then actually, you know, many years passed. Uh, and then I, I remember, you know, maybe this could be considered my, my, my second introduction to role-playing games, which was when I saw on YouTube, this uh, D&D Diesel clip, which is when uh, Vin Diesel plays D&D &D for, I think, about 20 minutes with Matt Mercer and, and some, uh, some of the other Critical Role cast. And a friend of mine, who's also a big fan of like the Baldur's Gate games and uh, those type of fantasy games, and fantasy movies, and TV shows, he sent me this. And I was like, oh man, this is, this is so cool. And, and it kind of, you know, showed me that, you know, if you... Put some cool stuff on the table, like uh, you know, a skull, some candles, and you make it really atmospheric. You play some music in the background, and you really start to narrate, like I saw at that time, uh, Matt Mercer do. I was just astonished by, okay, this is there's something magical going on there, right? So that's when I, like, it rekindled my interest completely. I bought the fifth edition books. Uh, and, you know, we just started playing with, with my, uh, with, I, I gathered some friends, we, uh, we got into 5th edition and uh, started some campaigns, uh, and, and that's how I got into it uh, later again, which was like, what, what must it be now, like 7, 8 years ago, something like this, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, I'm not like uh, someone who played early, early editions. Uh, of of D and D, though, uh, I still I always remember those being around, you know. But uh, but I got really into it with with fifth edition and and later uh, because I've always had this interest and I tried to get some of my friends to play Call of Cthulhu even before this, before D and Diesel, before fifth edition, and somehow they just didn't seem interested. I think maybe the vibe or the setting. Uh, didn't appeal to them as much, but they really got into 5th edition D&D. And then later, once we were into role-playing and, you know, uh, getting together every week anyway to play those games, it was much easier to also, you know, try again to get Call of Cthulhu to the table, which uh, I have to say, uh, up until now, is one of my favorite uh, tabletop role-playing games. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, and that is, that's an interesting... Bit, that's an interesting bit of origin, given the subject matter that you that 
you've leaned you've leaned into for Blood and Doom. So, out, so out yeah. of curiosity, um, what what were the chain of events that led that led you to, um, being be, leaning towards Five E in those in those early days, to to eventually doing your doing your own thing with Blood and Doom? Was it a case of this being a um, something that you just, that just house ruled your way into be into being a thing. Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, well, first of all, when you when you start playing any tabletop role playing game, you don't really know what it's all about, or you have nothing to compare it to. It's it's just a ton of fun anyway, you know. And then we, I, I think it was must have been like after four or five years of playing those D and D campaigns. And started to explore some some other games, right? So Call of Cthulhu got to the table. Uh, I tried uh, Numenera, uh, various other games as well, and that just showed me that there was a different way to play as well. And I think because I was always and am still most of the time the game master, right? As a game master, you you tend to look for things, right? You're writing your session notes, your homebrewing your own world. So you go online, you look, you, you get into contact a lot quicker than your players who most of them just, you know, come to your house every week, sit at your table and play their characters. But you're like always researching, you know, finding tables or whatever, role tables, things to make your, your game better. So discovering all that and then starting to play some other games it really opened up my eyes as to what the different feel is for some some games right so you for me you had fifth edition on the one hand and let's take call of cthulhu as just a, an example but could be any other game and it just feels very different right um especially when once i started to explore some games that were more more free and open and less focused on rules, I started to feel this this relief because um, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with this, but in fifth edition, it's written in a way where it seems to promote the kind of um, behavior of look, look, it says right here, you know, like page 76, you know, third paragraph, this rule says exactly this and it does exactly that. and. It kind of depends on your group, of course, but the way I started out with my group, you know, my players tended to be very specific about these things. They're all, uh, a lot of them are also Magic the Gathering uh, players, which is a game that is actually, you know, it requires you to be very specific about the rules because that's what it's all about. It needs to be very specific. You know, what happens first? In what order do we resolve this, etc., etc. And I don't know, for me personally, I just found it very exciting and interesting to see that there were some other games out there that are a little bit more rules light and that are a bit more narrative, you know, that take a more narrative approach that lend themselves a little bit better towards uh, theater of the mind kind of gameplay. Mm -hmm. Because that's also one of the things that I'm very interested in is, you know, when, when you put a a battle map on the table and you use miniatures i mean it has its utility and i like it a lot but there's something there's something happening when you're just talking to people and you're imagining it i just i experimented with this in fifth edition with my group and i just noticed immediately how they were much more creative in what they were describing much more open to what they were about to do as opposed to looking at those squares on the on the map so that kind of evolved into then you know as a game master especially being like hmm you know it's interesting what's happening here but i still feel like D, &D has this it has this nice crunch this nice um uh, system for players to customize their uh, characters um, it just seemed to me that some of the more lightweight games were were missing maybe some of this and so you know that's how the idea slowly was born to to develop start developing my own game blood and doom and not just based by the way on the rules or anything specifically related to that but also the setting because even though I love the the sort of vanilla fantasy setting um, I 
I, I kind of grew a little bit bored with it. And I just saw Blood and Doom set in a world with, you know, vast deserts, humid jungles. You know, there's like ancient temples buried beneath the jungle. Uh, I, just a little bit more of a ad high adventurous world. You know, the Conan-esque mm -hmm. kind of uh, uh, type world. And one where things do really matter because I was at that time also watching a lot of those videos about, you know, like the OSR and like game philosophy and about, and, and it is true, you know, one of the things, and sorry if I'm going on a too much of a <laughs> tangent with this, but one of the things I remember that I first ever wanted to change about D&D 5th edition was dark vision, because to me, it seemed quite weird to to have this proposition of okay maybe you'll bring some torches and maybe we'll go down into some dark places but it doesn't really matter because all of you have chosen these races that can just see in the dark and there's like one human in the group and yeah whatever you know you just tell them what you see and uh, be get on with it so and i know there's all kinds of nuance to this you know you don't see that far and it's not in color and etc etc but Something about that in Blood and Doom, I also felt like I, I really wanted to change. You know, things need to matter, it needs to be dangerous. And, and then, of course, when you look at a game like Call of Cthulhu, which is uh, very lethal, it feels... I mean, maybe it's the wrong term to, to use to describe it, but to me, it feels a little bit more adult. You know, it feels like it's a, a serious game. And, and I, I don't mean that in a way as, like, my players or me... Uh, don't make jokes or laugh for hours on end when we're playing. That That's not what I'm talking about, because I, I think that's a ton of fun. But just in its approach, it feels a little bit more uh, serious and slightly more realistic to me. And I found that very appealing. And that, that kind of all got together into, um, you know, starting the, the Blood and Doom project. Mm -hmm. Now, with, with, that in, with that in mind... Uh... Did you were you were you already a fan of of um sword and of sword and sorcery before blood blood and doom? What was your introduction to that particular style of fantasy? Yeah, so I'll freely admit, slightly embarrassed, uh, uh, so, but that I'm not uh, an avid reader, but I'm I've been from a young age on. Uh, I've watched a lot of movies. I really like movies, and I like I like the current generation of TV shows as, as well, which offer like you know the same quality and production and writing as that you see on uh, on bigger budget movies these days. So um, from a young age on, I remember watching uh, these movies like well, of course the, the Conan the Barbarian movies. There's the Beastmaster. There's there's movies like some of the names i even forgot but there's like Sin sinbad and uh, the the the, vo the the voyage what i don't i don't even remember the names exactly but it's these type of they use a lot of the, it's the, it's from an era where they use those stop motion techniques you know where you see these skeletons moving and they move like this really uh and, and that's what i really liked and i think those had that more um grounded feeling of adventure you know um and not so much as uh, oh magic is all around you and it's it's pretty readily available and it's pretty fantastical um so that's that's kind of how i got into contact with the the more sword and sorcery uh feel of it all and also you know aside from i mean sword and sorcery or not i enjoy even in D&D 5th edition, I enjoy the most, like the first five or six levels is what I enjoy the most. And it's hard to explain exactly why, but I guess it has something to do with these, like the humble beginnings, that, you know, where things still matter, where if you're going from, you know, uh, town A to town B, you know, it's a big thing because, you know, you might get murdered along the way, right? <laughs> you know, road bandits might kill you. And it's that sense of tension. Um, and that just brings with it a, a, 
a certain amount of adventure that I think some people conflate with, you know, like the bigger it gets when, you know, you, you have a campaign where you go out and fight with the gods themselves. And that, that sounds like it's actually a bigger adventure. But in my opinion, you know, sometimes less is more, especially when it comes to these kinds of things. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, with that in mind, when it comes to... Blood and Doom. The core, the core mechanic is, as I understand it, a success-based D10 die pool. Yeah. Now, correct. Um, you you mentioned you mentioned quite a bit regarding Call of Cthulhu, which is D, which is D100 based. Where did you where did you nail down that you wanted to do um, a success-based um, set of D10s? What what would you say was the big influence to that direction? Yes, well, trial and error is what I can say about that. So many things have been attempted. Um, D20 to D20 system plus modifier to D10. I tried so many different things, also trying to find some completely different and unique systems, uh, you know, based on, um, for example, um, ability, skill, items that you have, and then each has like a die, D4, D6, D8, you know, and then the higher, the larger the die, the, the, the higher your like level or experience. You know, I tried so many things and play tested them all. And I guess eventually, I think what, what appealed to me most about just simply trying the dice pool, because to be honest, I think one of the few games I tried which actually has a dice pool was Vampire the Masquerade, Changeling the Lost, and I Tales from the Loop. So I think that's the extent of my, my own experience with dice pools up, up until that time. And what I like about the dice pool is, first of all, it's kind of tactile, so no, so the better you are at something, the more dice you collect in your hand, and that just feels nice to do, right? And once you've, you know, rolled uh, a dice pool a couple of times, you know, even if it's just like five or six dice, it kind of feels underwhelming to just roll one d20, you know, and with all respect to, I mean, it's a great system, and I love the d20, but you're just rolling that single d20 i don't know it just feels different you know there's it, there's a lot of psychological elements i think that come into play here and just grabbing a bunch of dice like oh my ability score is four my skill is three let's roll seven dice let's see what happens and also there's less math involved you know i tried many systems and you you mustn't forget these days a lot of people they play online and everything is calculated automatically and I tried some iterations of the game where people had to add up like uh, maybe two modifiers, I think. And some people have trouble with this, you know, like adding, subtracting once you get to like numbers of six, seven. Um, so just basically building that dice pool and then just counting your successes uh, can, be, can be very, you know, easy to, to, to get a hold of. Um, and then what I like as well about the dice pool is that it's very easy to roll the dice. You've got a certain number of successes that you need to roll. And then any, any that you roll above the required number, you can kind of use for some purpose. You know, it's an indication of, okay, you succeeded, but you, you did more than just succeed, right? You've got, you've got this and that. You've got like maybe two extra successes and then in blood and doom for example that translates to momentum and this momentum you can then spend on uh, uh you know helping boosting an ally giving them you know an advantage to their role uh you can uh, activate some of your weapons attributes you know making some some cool combat moves so i think that just comes much more natural and i'm i am fully aware that there's d20 based modifier uh, games out there that kind of do the same but it's it's uh, to me it doesn't appeal to me at all when it becomes too complicated. You know, you have to do a lot of maths. Uh, you know, like it's plus two or what. When you succeed with like three or more above the you know required target number, that just doesn't seem to work as well with a D twenty system uh, as that it as it does with a with a dice pool system. So that's what I what I like about it. Mm -hmm. 
now even even with that um the na the name blood and doom is not is not just is not just a fa is just just a fancy little title for a sword and sorcery game but a reference to two per to um two particular resources that you have cuz i did notice a a very interesting doubling down on on managing resources you have mom specifically momentum blood points and doom points um yeah exactly I'm curious how that how that particular thing ca thing came about. Yes, well, um, from the early development of the game, I already decided that one of the things that I wanted to do is to have to have martial classes. So, for example, like the barbarian or the guardian, uh, to have them be able to wield powers. And these powers would be like feats of, of great, you know, uh, usually they're related to like uh, melee combat, range combat, or they're not magical, but they feel almost like they're some kind of a spell, right? But, but then again, they're definitely not magical in nature, but they allow these characters to do something extraordinary, so to speak, but, in, uh, but limited, right? So the blood points you spend allow you to uh to use these powers only up until uh a specific number of times that you know each ha each one has a blood point cost so uh, one power might cost you one blood point to execute another mm -hmm. two usually it's one or two you know th th that's it you know there's some rare ones that cost you three blood points and then the idea was to use this exact same system for the magic classes with regards to their spells, right? Mm -hmm. And they'd also be using these blood points. And that to me was very interesting. I don't even know how or why I came up with this, but that just seemed to make a lot of sense because it makes it super easy for anyone to get into this game. And it's a unified point system that when you are a druid, you're using your blood points to cast spells or should I say to channel nature, because when you get really specific about it, it, the druid actually doesn't cast spells, but channels nature, but it's magic, right? And the barbarian, as an example, uses those blood points to do his like uh, extremely uh, savage attack, you know, you know, swirling his sword around, attacking three enemies at once or whatever he does. So that, that was kind of how blood points got into the game. And I think it wasn't until later that doom points were added to this and i think first those had another name but some people uh, in the team who joined the project later commented like you know if you've got blood points you know why not make it blood points and doom points because that would just be super cool and and i totally agreed with them so hence they were uh, renamed to doom points and the doom points have uh, serve a different uh, function entirely actually and they allow you to re-roll dice so when you fail you can spend uh, a doom point get another chance of success but at the same time there's this kind of luck based system you know for those who are listening or familiar with call of cthulhu it's it's similar in a way to that in that the more doom points you spend um the worse off you're going to be later because the doomsayer as, as the game master is known in Blood and Doom, the Doomsayer can ask you for a Doom roll in decisive moments, but also in moments when you're basically asking the Doomsayer, hey, um, do I spot this and this in this shop? You know, do they have this healing potion? Or, you know, I got locked up in the prison cell. Is there maybe a loose brick here that I can try to make my escape and and i think it's just a ton of fun as the doomsayer to say you know i don't know i really don't know but make me a doom roll and if you succeed there's a loose brick and you can make your you can try and make your escape that way if you fail your doom roll then there isn't and then you'll have to find another way uh, to deal with being locked up in the prison so you can spend those doom points to get an advantage in the moment, mm -hmm. but the more the more of those you spend, the well, the more your luck is gonna run out basically in the in the long run. And I think that's that's a lot of fun to do. And I tend to use them 
quite frequently actually those doom rolls you know and especially when because as as a as a game master or doomsayer you can prepare all you want but at the end of the day you know you don't know what the players are going to do and you'll have to come up with things on the fly anyway and sometimes it just feels like for me to tell a player yes there is a loose brick in this prison cell or no you know knowing that i didn't even maybe have this entire prison cell written out or planned in my notes or whatever it just feels like why not leave this up to chance it's a lot more fun and it's fun for me as well because who am i to decide right how can i even know even though i'm the game master uh you know and of course it, it works just as well if you just say yes or no but to me it's a lot more fun to have them make a roll and see if maybe they get lucky so uh so that's kind of how those two came into the game and momentum really is, is isn't uh, you know because you keep track of your doom points and you keep track of your blood points momentum isn't like that at all you know whenever you have an action you roll your dice you've got some extra successes you can spend them as momentum but if you don't they're gone anyway right so it's just it's it's not really those aren't really points right it's just a way of uh giving a name to those extra successes that you can spend to do what you know uh, to use for your action that you're doing at that particular time mm -hmm. yeah now since you since you brought up the barbarian and and the like um I yeah. will note that I I did find the class and archetype setup that you have very interesting. I'd like to, if you don't mind, I'd like I'd like to go through the the classes that you've mentioned with it. On, yeah, on both, sure. On both the site and not on the Kickstarter page and in the primer, um, and just get a, just get a feel for what sort of play style you're going to be leaning into. Um, before yeah. that, um, just out of curiosity. The ones in, the ones in the core in the in the primer, there's mm -hmm, two archetypes yeah. each. Um, yeah. In the full book, how many archetypes do you plan on having for each class? It's still going to be just two, but there will be five more classes. So there will be so right now in the primer books, there's four classes, mm -hmm. each with two archetypes. So basically, there's uh, eight archetypes. Um, and in the final book, there's going to be uh, no. Actually, we on sorry, apologies. We unlocked the priest class, so we have ten classes and uh, twenty archetypes eventually for the for the final game. So that's an update. Yeah. So um, you might be wondering, I because I'm trying to see where you're going with this. You might be wondering, you know, why only two archetypes? And you know, uh, I don't really think some classes need three or four or five archetypes you know i one of the things i dislike about fifth edition for example is just the overwhelming amount of choice and you know it's all so close together you see the thing is these archetypes there might be only two for each class but they are so unique and you choose them when you create your character that you might say each is a unique class in its own right mm -hmm. So uh, what you effectively get, if you're playing a barbarian nomad or you're playing uh, a barbarian gladiator, those are f entirely different. And none of the traits or powers that they can get uh, or can choose are shared between them. Yeah. So, yeah. So like, like I said, going, for, going from top to bottom, just to get, just yeah. to get a feel for the play style of, e of each... Let's mm. let's start with barbarian. Yeah. So the barbarian is of course one of the well, I guess m m more well-known classes in in any game and uh the idea is that the nomad is your typical uh you know, wilderness wandering free roaming uh you know, I shall not be ruled by anyone or kept inside any city walls type uh, person who who hunts, gathers, uh, you know, fights, uh, pillages, maybe. And the gladiator is, is born in, or well, not necessarily born, but at least for some time of, of his or her life, uh spent in captivity you know um 
as you see, um, for example, uh, Conan, even uh, when you watch those movies, for some time he's he's being put in, in these these uh, fights, you know, where he has to fight uh, opponents in some kind. Well, it's not exactly in an arena, but like a small fighting pit. So they're like a, an expertly trained fighting machine capable of wielding like any weapon in existence and they are not really versed in uh you know the the wilderness or or uh, navigating handling animals uh, perhaps but they're much more of a uh, well you could say an, an urban uh, barbarian in in that sense so that's kind of uh, you know so it's it's at the same time as being an archetype there's there's some kind of uh you know a, sense of a background to it as well you know like where you come from what what have you uh, experienced yeah mm -hmm. so next is guardian yeah so the guardian is is your is your knight right your valiant knight and there's two there's two archetypes the warden is is like a personal bodyguard it's like uh for example brienne of tarth in uh, game of thrones Mm -hmm. is my favorite example for this it's like she will swear loyalty to someone and just she won't give up and she'll give her life to you know accomplish whatever she has sworn to do uh and in this sense uh it's a per it's personal so the warden is like really really good at you know protecting their allies you know whenever you are close to the warden you should feel pretty safe because they have a lot of traits and powers that play into helping their allies and the vanguard is similar in a way but is a little bit more your i'll head first into the battle uh run up front i'll inspire my allies to uh to achieve greatness in combat and i'll uh, you know lead the charge and 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 help you up when you get down you know uh, either we will all leave this battlefield uh, standing together all or we'll all die together I, I will not leave your side you know mm -hmm. so so that's how that one is a little bit different than the than the guardian uh, than the warden sorry yeah. so next would be the hunter um no oh wait you are looking at the actual list i'm looking at the primer bundle at the moment <laughs> yeah so th so you have to take into account that you know a lot of this still needs to be written mm -hmm. so you know i I can tell you basically the basics of, of, of the Hunter, you know, one of them is going to be all about being a great shot with a bow and arrow, and the other one is going to be focused more on their pet companion. Uh, but beyond that, you know, we're, we're still working on those, on those classes, because this one is not included in the, in the primer bundle. Mm -hmm. So I feel, I mean, I could, you know, talk about it for a little bit more, but I, I, I'd feel... Um, you know, maybe it will change a bit. So I don't want people to start expecting one thing and then, you know, get to see something else later. All right. Fair. That is that is that is certainly fair. Um, yeah, because right now we're talking about things that that are yet to come, you know, so so to yeah. speak. Yeah. So um, next on the list is Shaman. Yeah. So the Shaman is uh, is an, an in because I I think it, it's it's um, similar in a way to a druid on the one hand, but different in that first of all they they don't have any like specific relation to shape shifting or turning into animals, but they're all about performing uh, rituals to aid their cause and uh, summoning uh, spirits. So um, that's what the shaman will mostly be about. What exactly? distinguishes these two archetypes i still have to work out in much more detail but the idea is that there because what i wanted to do with blood and doom is each magic class doesn't take spells from a common list because i really really dislike that about uh for example uh, in D D, it's like oh great you're uh you know you're a barbarian and now you've chosen this archetype and now you can choose a few druid spells or now the bard can choose a few warlock spells or whatever and it i just want your archetype to be really unique right so in that sense 
the druid as well as the shaman and the sorcerer have not only do they have unique you know spells or or nature channelings or or whatever you might call them but they also um they they have an entirely different way of of operating right so the shaman is summoning spirits which which is not really to to say to cast a spell or to channel nature because the sorcerer casts spells which he or she learns uh, from studying ancient tomes that contain you know the, the the script and the information about these spells so it's much more like your you might say what what would be maybe a wizard in, in dnd for example but then with like a more darker edge right because this is like more it's more like tapping into forbidden knowledge almost um and but then again the druid basically uses their connection with nature to to shape it and to bend it to their will and they don't even really like i mean to say that they are casting a spell uh would not be the the right word right so in this sense that's what the shaman does is an entirely different approach summoning uh spirits that they you know keep around them or can send forth into the world to to do things for them uh and that could either be of utility you know during combat or out of combat so there's a lot of fun things that i'm i'm thinking about doing with that mm -hmm. so next on the list would be the assassin yes your assassin and and uh so there's two archetypes one of them some people have commented on so I'm, I, because it's called the ninja and i i do agree with some people that you know uh it it may be linked a bit too much to our own world so, so to 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 have people stay in this suspension of disbelief of, of being in a different world this will likely be renamed to something like the shadow blade uh, once the game comes out so there's the assassin has two archetypes the ninja or shadow blade whatever it will end up being and there's the viper and so the let's say the ninja as it currently still uh, is described uh, in the in the primer books is all about uh close melee combat they're kind of like martial experts um they you know they blend into the shadows uh you know like a true assassin they take out their opponent without getting seen and the viper does the same but uses uh, makes a lot more use of traps uh and also uh poisons and is more oriented towards ranged combat and using crossbows and kind of you know uh, and also they have uh something very cool they have this trait where they have a selection of masks that they can wear the viper and uh this gives them some kind of semi-magical power as well for example there's one mask that allows them to see you know anything hidden or concealed that someone is carrying uh, and they also have a collection of uh, venomous friends so there's like a scorpion a spider and a serpent that they can release uh, and that will do their bidding and uh, so it's it's a different you know type of assassin and i do want to state that you know the reason i wanted an assassin in the game and not like a rogue is that i do not see the the profession of assassination being linked to being a criminal so the whole link between being an assassin but at the same time being a thief uh i do not see so you know you can be an assassin and be versed in picking locks and going about unseen uh without necessarily being someone who steals if you if you get my meaning so that's a distinction that i really wanted to make with the assassin mm-hmm Oh, and speak, speaking of which, for the for the final game, I do intend to have another look at all those archetypes and their names, and also see because you know it's an ongoing process right now. So as we as we'll be writing up more about the world of a theater and the setting, uh, I think it would be very cool to have for each class and each archetype have described you know how the different cultures view uh people you know who who are of this archetype and maybe 
what their names could be, you know, in the different regions of the world and, and, and link that more together and really glue the, the archetypes more into the setting itself. But that will be something that's pretty easy to do and a lot of fun to do, I think, when, when we start writing more and more about the setting. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So next up, next up on my list would be the Slayer. Yeah, so the Slayer is your it's inspired in uh, uh, by uh, a character such as the Witcher, for example. They are basically an expert monster hunter, and they use like whatever means necessary, whether it be traps, potions, tools, uh, gimmicks, to uh, to just be the the best at slaying monsters, which is which is what they do and what they get hired for. Um, so um yeah that's that's as far as and again you know these are classes that you're asking me about that we still need to write so you know i'll be honest and uh so it's difficult for me to to give you a lot of details about that but i think when i say think about gerald from the witcher i think you get a pretty good idea mm -hmm. of what a, of what a slayer is all about yeah mm -hmm. so next would be the druid or the our uh, and every t every time I see Druid, I keep thinking of Mystery of the Druids, that weird weird adventure game. Oh, I I do not know it, but you, I mean Druids have I think it's one of my favorite classes and has always been. Um, and what I decided to do with the Druid in Blood and Doom is the two archetypes. There's actually only one archetype that can shapeshift into uh, a beast, mm -hmm. so they're very different. So the kindred is all about uh, beasts and plants and communing with nature, and it's your typical, you know, druid, druid as as you see in many other games. And the stargazer is more is more a learned druid who doesn't shy away from visiting cities, doing research, uh, using orreries to study the skies, uh, works with. Uh, prophecies predicting the future um, uses a lot more elemental based magic so controlling you know the elements earth fire water uh, what have you and and as such actually the stargazer has very little to do with necessarily beasts or plants but takes an entirely different approach like a slightly more alchemist or scientific approach to mm -hmm. uh, to bending nature to uh, to his will. Yeah. Um, so next would be the the minstrel. Yeah, the minstrel is of course uh, the one who plays the music and inspires the rest, uh, so that they will do great deeds. And I I I think the minstrel, you know, they will be pretty. Uh, combat capable as well in blood and doom so i want to have this kind of um more resilient combat capable uh version if you will of a, a bard type character you know the minstrel in this case mm -hmm. and um and there will be one who um there's two archetypes and one archetype will focus mostly on like really being a lore expert right and and just knowing a lot about the world and the other will be more focused on inspiring their uh, their allies yeah mm -hmm. so but still need to write a lot about uh, about the about the minstrel yep and lastly when it comes to the classes the sorcerer yes yeah, so like i said so the sorcerer is in essence one of the darker classes in uh in the game uh when it comes because as i said they learn their spells from actually studying books but you know if i'm gonna make comparisons to D, &D for example they are definitely not a wizard uh they would be maybe more like a warlock type character who has this they have this darker side to them so it's it's like they're not i mean by all means they're not a cultist or they don't have evil intentions but the the magic that they use is definitely um it's tricky it's dangerous and it's it has it's, it has a darker side and there will be uh, one archetype that focuses on 
illusions and such and manipulating their environment and another one that's going to be more about um you know your your uh, offensive kind of magic and uh, and that sort of thing so mm -hmm. yeah and since it was unlocked what can you tell me about about what you have planned for the priest Yes, yeah, so very interesting. So the priest was, it was, oh my God, it was so popular and people were so kind and they really, really wanted the priest. And the more I started to think about it, the more I realized like, yeah, you know, the priest, I mean, given the setting of a theater and like the, there's like, I mean, how there's, you know, to explain a little bit, each of the five known regions of the world has their own pantheon within the setting already so like in total there's i think 77 combined gods and spirits you know divided up between the different regions so for example in ista which is the jungle region they actually i mean and i'm i'm saying you know like on average right because there's always exceptions but most people there worship nature spirits uh, which is entirely different from the pantheon you see in Athenia, where they have like your more Greek Roman, uh, you know, uh, uh, gods that that have some kind of a domain and that they have temp they build temples for and that they worship in that way. So, uh, in that sense, it you know it, it's pretty interesting. Oh, and by the way, in the in the, in the standard ways, they have a, a, a handful of gods that they usually only curse to when things go wrong because it's just this it's a forsaken place and there's really no actual prayer of any sort going on but you know that in in that sense the priest uh was you know a great addition to the game and um i'm actually working this out uh at the moment as as we speak uh so we're we're looking at some of the archetypes uh you know templar uh, the Exorcist, the Inquisitor are things that are on the table. Uh, still have to decide on what it's going to be exactly. Um, and, you know, it it will be a lot of fun. I'll, I'll have to see what we're going to do with the whole... Because right now you have three class types. There's the martial, expert and magic type. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll remove that from the game because it really... It, it doesn't really come up in any of the rules anyway. Um, and then the priest could maybe be, a, you know, like not necessarily be categorized as such so much, you know, like not a med because I feel like the priest could be, you know, could be a magic class, but then again, maybe they'll have powers instead of magic. So, or maybe we could do a, a combination. So one archetype has uses magic and another uses power. So we'll see, but it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, so I can't reveal too much about it yet, but with all the gods that are uh, in the game, I definitely think you know we'll we'll have to link that to the gods and write that up as we are uh, detailing out all the lore about the gods as well. You know, it ne that needs to be done at the same time, and it really needs to be incorporated. And mm -hmm. then again, like I said before, so maybe I'm repeating myself a little bit, but. I want to do the exact same thing with all the other archetypes as well. You know, really tie them in more to the setting, you know, and that will all come together nicely when we start to really, you know, work out more the, the things that we have now just, you know, touched upon in the in the primer bundle. Oh, now but that's as far as the classic. Well, yeah. I mean, they say touched upon. There's still 500 pages, but, you know, it's the mm -hmm. beginning. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I am curious if you have an, if you have any plans for a any sort of gish like ar like archetype um, gish if you're not oh, if you're not aware. Oh, you mean like uh, yeah, I know you 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 mean like uh, psionics? Uh, no, right? not, or... no, no, no. Oh. Um, oh, okay. Gish is a, is a catch-all term for characters who de who dabble in fi in fighting and casting. Ah, I see this way. Okay, no, I mean, no. Look, there's there's a few things to go about it with this. And, and I think, I mean, uh, we have a great community already on Discord where I'm talking to people and we, I mean, I can actually say it's, it's really true in the broader sense of the word that we are listening and we are actually shaping the game based on some of the feedback that we're getting and you know some of the the people have commented you know i would love to be able to combine you know maybe do some multi-classing so that could be 
either in the game as a basis or it could be added as an optional rule. So I see there's something there where you could maybe combine uh, traits or powers or magic from one or different mm -hmm. classes or archetypes. Then again, I might say, you know, if you're going to multi-class, you'll need to, you know, you, you cannot, if you're a barbarian, you still cannot, like, take any of those magic classes uh, spells. Mm -hmm. you, you'll have to choose something from maybe the Guardian or the Assassin or yeah. something more adjacent. But so I, I you know, I, it, I never say never, but at first glance, I'm not a big fan of wanting to do it all, right? So I want to be a great fighter and I want to cast spells. I'm like, you know, either or and, you know, enjoy what there is and let some other player shine with using their magic and another player shine with using their combat prowess. And why would you want to have it both, right? That's sometimes what I'm thinking. And of course, it, it's great, but then I think you'd need to move towards a game where both is achievable by all classes and all archetypes. You, you get my meaning? So, so it's because otherwise this would be this one special class that everyone is going to be super hyped about because, well, you know, they, they are, you know, both great in combat and they know how to use magic. So, but then again, you know, like I said, with the priest class, maybe there's some some middle way to be found there. And to be honest, some of the powers are, you know, they're not magical in nature, but they, they border on the impossible. You know what I mean? That's why you spend blood points because you're, you're achieving feats of, of, of great strength, for example, or so, you know, in that sense, if, whether it's a power or whether it's magic, you know, it works differently, but there, I mean, there's some, there's something there, there's some overlap there. So, you know, Oh. Um, but no, I, I wasn't familiar with the with the term, by the way. But um, you know, who knows? And I'll never say never. But for now, I I I prefer, you know, sticking to something more specific, and then maybe doing an uh, doing a multi class uh, rule in the game, so that people can just mix and match, you know, as they see fit. Yeah. Now, with the if if I'm if I may present a al alternate opinion because I'm I can see where you're coming mm -hmm. from on that but yeah since you brought since you brought up Geralt of, since you brought up Geralt from The Witcher um yeah consider consider this Geralt has has both has both martial and magical skills yeah the magic True. is in the form of the signs which are useful but he's not but when it comes to raw magic anyone who is a is a source. I'm not. I'm not going to get into the details on that. Is going mm -hmm. to outstrip him when it comes to when it comes to magical ability. But his but his signs are a different kind of tool. Yeah, um, I see. I see. Yeah, and I mean, and definitely do feel free to change my mind. And I I like this, and I like input a lot uh, so, because I'm you know to me it's a, it's a continuous journey. I I have no. Uh, opinion about like this should be it and there's no other way and, but it's interesting because you know i think f this for the slayer class could be a trait where they you know let's i mean again it's, it's not going to be exactly this of course but let's say if it were gerald you know there, there could be a trait where you have a selection of uh let's say there's eight of these symbols you get to choose three of them uh, and you know, each of them does something and it's, you know, and, and in this sense, that is the same as the assassin Viper who has these near magical masks that they can use. So, you know, there's, I think there's like four or five masks and they, you know, when you create your character and you, you, when you select that trait, you, you choose two of those masks that you, that you own and that you know how to use. And when you improve the trait, you can, you can get a few more. So those are, like you say, you know, those are near magical, it, it, but it's not a spell, right? So I totally agree. And I think that can definitely work, but I think that can work as is, yeah, with, with either traits or powers. And I do have to say that from the conception of the game up until later writing, 
I do feel like I myself was starting to get more into this, to into what you say, right? Because when I first started writing, it was more strict. And then the Viper, for example, with the near magical masks is one of the later archetypes that I worked out. And I feel like it's very interesting, but it's growing. You know what I mean? This is growing on me as we are, are writing it. So in that sense, I think definitely yes. Yeah, that is, and I do want to implement more of that in the game. But but the, the Slayer, for example, will not have, you know, magic as, as in such like casting a, a spell or something like that. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah, but good good point. Yeah. Yeah, it's now with the, with that in mind, um <laughs> when it comes to when it comes to the when it, when it comes to the set the setting of a theer, um as well as as well as the cults that you're that you're building around. Um mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is it a, is it a case where, within the description of each of them, do you plan on ha do you plan on putting in something where it ex where it's going to be exploring um, the go the goals, the attitudes, and who the cult who the cults happen to like or dislike. Because cults um, don't play well with others. No, they they don't. They they don't. They are not famous for playing well with others at all. And um, well, I mean, uh, again, for for anyone watching or listening, you know, there's three books, right? So there's the core rule book. Mm -hmm. which has all your rules and your classes. Then there's the guide to a tier, which is all about the setting, the world, the regions, the gods, and it also has your, your, your bestiary and your, your, your monster vault uh, with a ton of monsters. And then there's the 12 Pillars of Doom, which is uh, a pretty interesting book because it, it's not something that you usually find in other games, even if a setting is built in... Uh, sometimes it's one book, you know, rules and setting, or it's two books, you know, rules and setting separate. But here, a special book dedicated to cult. So why? Okay, because Blood and Doom, there's a specific story behind the world and the times uh, as are presented in the game, you know, the timeline, there's certain... Uh, alignments in the in in the in the stars and the, you know I won't I won't I don't want to spoil anything for those you know that that are wanting to play it, but the, you know it's it's a time rife with freak occurrences and it's a great time for the cults. Let's put it that way because you know things are aligned in a way where their rituals and their goals and their purposes are at like a heightened level of you know you know getting the job done for them if they want to and if and if they succeed so all these cults all 12 of them uh i think you know in the primer books both cover like 40 pages each or something now we may need to edit that down a little bit because we need to fit 12 in a book but you know each each is going to be at least 30 pages and um, it describes everything you say, right? So who do they like? Who, do, who don't they like? Who do they tend to look towards when they recruit people, right? And, and do they even recruit? For example, the Yukashin, they are a cult that tends to target the downtrodden and the outcasts of society and when they are vulnerable you know uh, one of the lectors might spot this and talk to them and tell them about this fantastic truth that they know about and you know maybe see if they are interested in becoming one you know and you know why why are people actually different you know why should there be someone in power and someone without any clothes on clothes on their back and and they were actually all the same and there's a whole story behind this but then again the Shaddai which is one of the other cults in the uh, in the primer they don't recruit at all because they there's the dreamers so their herald of doom because each each cult is based around a herald of doom which is like a, an alien godlike entity that that they worship and um Lanesh, which is the 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 entity 
that the Shaddai worship is imprisoned in the world somewhere, they don't know where, and from within his slumber, he, he can only manage to, to send out these messages to a few individuals and they, they start to dream about him and they start to have these visions about what needs to be done. And these individuals just happen to be, by chance, selected by Lanesh and they eventually come together. I don't know if you have you seen the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind? Yes. Uh, yeah, so this idea, all those people, they're like making these... It's a long time since I've seen it, but I remember this guy, he's making this mountain from, from clay or whatever. And all these people, they're, they're drawn to this place. They don't really understand why. And it's, it's the same with the dreamers in the Shaddai. And eventually they get together and they learn about their purpose. Uh, so, you know, just to give you a little bit of a, an insight into how different these cults actually are. And the Shaddai are all about building idols. They shape... You know, they're trying to build these statues that resemble the nation. They all do this because when building these idols and imbuing these with the souls of their victims that they sacrifice, they will learn more and more specifics about where Lanesh is imprisoned. And their final goal, of course, is to free Lanesh. While the Yukashin, they're much more grotesque and uh, well maybe even a more darker cult in that sense and that their entity uh daos is scattered throughout the universe and they're trying to assemble it's it's like bodily mass which consists of like millions of like faces and arms and legs and you know it's really it's a grotesque thing to behold and they're trying to bring it together and summon it forth in the world through a portal so that it may uh, absorb all living being, you know? And while the Shaddai are actually, the dreamers are actually trying to be rulers of the world, you know, to kind of enslave all humankind under their control. So there's big differences in all the cults. Each one will be unique um, and they'll all have their own ways of recruiting. There's also the doom levels, right? So. Aside from each cult having their own specific monsters that they can summon, uh, there's artifacts unique to the cult, there's different spells they can cast, there's tomes and scrolls and librams. All those things are described much in a way as you see in, for example, uh, a Call of Cthulhu campaign like Masks of Nyarlathotep. You know, and kind of in this way... You, you see those cults worked out in, in this book. And the Doom levels, what they do is they show the, the, the Doomsayer, all right, so this is how a cult like this could form, right? And then what would their, what is their goal and how will they try and achieve it? And it's all worked out. And then it says, okay, if they succeed, right, then you you increase the doom level it you know it becomes doom level two there's three each cult has three doom levels and this is like this is a meta term right so you don't actually tell the players oh we're at doom level two now but it's it's for the doomsayer to to know like okay this is what's going on so they've achieved their first goal then doom level two happens they gain some more powers they have the ability to uh, cast more powerful spells because they've obtained such and such in a book or they know how to summon uh, different types of monsters or maybe their herald of doom has now granted them you know more influence and then it says okay so what's their next goal what are they going to do and at each at each point you know it states you know uh, what will happen next and and what might they do if the players you know uh, succeed in thwarting their plans so i think that's really cool and it should be pretty easy to look at the chapter chapters just choose a cult and build an adventure or a campaign and entirely around one of those cults so i think that's really cool about uh, about that book and and that's actually what we did as well for Phases of Evil, which is the, the free adventure that you can download also from Drive Through RPG. And for Phases of Evil, we basically just took what was already written for the Yukashin cult and then um, and then used this as if we were 
you know, not the the writers of the material ourselves looked at it and be like, okay, so now let's try and design an adventure from this, right? And, and so people can actually see a perfect example of, of how you could build your own adventure around it. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Now, what are you shooting for as far as the page count for each of the books? Yeah, so the the core rule book is probably going to be around 420, 440 pages around this size. Um, I don't want to make the book too too you know uh, too thick because I don't I don't really like books that are too you know unwieldy to to handle or have at the table. But something you know I I have in my house the the set with the Numenera books. Uh, which are great looking books, fantastic art. And I always take those and I talk to the printing press and I'm talking about, you know, paper weights and sizes. And I'm, I'm always looking at those Numenera books. And I, I decided that I don't want the books to be, um, well, not thicker than those, or at least not by much, right? Because those feel really nice to me. And when I take a book, like, for example, uh, Pathfinder Second Edition. Uh, I mean, uh, nothing against this game, but that is not that is not that is not a book that I find appealing. It's way too big. It's too heavy. I don't like it at all. So you know, so that's the the page count we're looking at. And then for uh, the guide to a tier and the Twelve Pillars of Doom, both each of those will be around three hundred and seventy five pages, maybe. You know, 386 something. You know, in to uh, and you might wonder why I'm talking these weird numbers because it has to be divided by eight because that's the way <laughs> printing works. But mm -hmm. anyway, so so that's the what we're thinking about. So and that will come in the set in the slipcase set, uh, all three of those. Yeah. Yeah. But oh, that being said, you know the the game uh, for those listening, the game if you want. The game is perfectly playable using only the core rulebook. You don't have to use the guide to a tier. You don't have to use the 12 Pillars of Doom. And all the Doomsayer advice is included in the core rulebook at the back. And some monsters are, will also be in there. Even though the largest number of monsters will be in the guide to a tier, there will be uh, a handful, or no, not a handful, I think a dozen, maybe two, in the core rulebook as well. So... If you, you know, cannot, for example, afford the entire set, or if you are not interested in playing in the setting or playing using the cults, just get the core rulebook and and you'll have anything you need to uh, to start playing Blood and Doom. You know, mm -hmm. that's no problem at all. Or or maybe you'll have the other ones as PDFs. You know, uh, so mm -hmm. yeah. And I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it develops. <laughs> so. But yes, we have we have a lot of work to do, and uh, like I said, so the uh, the first step now will be to I want to update the rules slightly, do a revision because you know there's two things I can do. You know, there's some feedback from the community, and I'm seeing some issues, and I'm like, okay, you're you're actually right about that, and I I, I do tend to notice that myself. Those are just two things I can do. I can either ignore it. And then everybody will have the books and we may need to do a second edition next year already, you know, and nobody is going to want that, least of all me. Or I'll spend like one, maybe two months now first on fixing those issues, doing more play testing, getting things up to speed, doing a revised edition of the primer bundle, which is and will always be free. Um, and then moving on to completing the the full game and then doing it right the first time so that's that's the plan right now so we've got a lot to do uh we're gonna try and do this side by side so as we are reworking uh the basic rules uh we will also uh keep uh writing for the setting and the cults and and get everything uh, by the end of the year to uh to our backers but it's a big project to be honest you know i'll be honest to you <laughs> if i were to do it again i would start smaller i tell this in every interview they, they say to me do you have any advice for yeah i'm just like yes my advice is just make a book you know a small book with like 60 pages and try that first <laughs> but you know this is a set but then again 
it's it's my dream you know so when i as soon as i started with this it started smaller but once i had you know experienced you know the writing process it started to grow and at a certain point you want to do some things and you just cannot uh leave it out anymore like the cults for example you know i i could not envision blood and doom without the cult book i could not envision it now with the extensive setting that we're doing and even though it's a three set book i think if you like what you see if you like a gritty game if you like that sword and sorcery feel but but quite a little you know like with some magic in there and you know it's not quite as as dry as your typical sort of sorcery game if you like cults if you like uh, uh deserts jungles if you want like a, a, a different kind of space to play in then i think this set will give you you know like endless possibilities and years and years and years of uh playable material all in your your basic set and we're doing a lot of those adventures as well so you know it's yeah it's going to be a ton of fun and a lot of work so but i look forward to it and it's it's uh it's great to do it's uh it's very exciting yeah and i like i said i will be certainly looking forward to seeing it Oh, but with all yeah. that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and brave the hell of time zones. And it's great. I love the temple, and it's uh, it feels um, very like I'm in a sanctuary. Mm -hmm. So you know, free to speak about uh, any and all subjects. So thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. uh, loved. I I tend to <laughs> maybe your listeners will think I tend to sometimes talk uh, a lot but that's just because i'm excited about something so sorry about that but it was great uh great being here so and uh great answering uh, all your questions talking a bit about uh, about blood and doom yeah and anytime you see fit to return the door is always open as i always say drinking is not mandatory but it is encouraged <laughs> okay, I will remember. for next time. I will ha because now I didn't, but I will have some beer beside me next time I visit uh, the temple. It's a good tip. So I'm not, I'm just a rookie now, but I will definitely return. Uh, beverage, alcoholic beverages included. Mm -hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gimming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>